Hello everyone at home and welcome to an empty barn theatre here in Sirencester. It's been a week since we launched our live streaming service Behind the Barn Door as part of our Save Our Barn initiative. Our aim is to provide our community with a mix of news, entertainment, music and children's content that reflects the inclusive ethos of the theatre. We are very excited tonight to bring you the first live stream of one of our previous productions, Henry V, which originally opened here at the barn on the 22nd of May 2019 and finished this run on the 22nd of June 2019, directed by the wonderful Hal Chambers. We are able to stream this performance only because of the generosity of the cast and the creatives. So from me, 
On behalf of the whole Barn Theatre team, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to everyone that made this possible. All that remains for me to say is please join us now as we go once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more! Assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But, pardon, gentles all, <laughs> the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks? that did affright the air at Agincourt. Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us, ciphers to this great account, on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two <laughs> mighty monarchies, Ooh. whose high up re-red and abutting fronts. The perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man. And make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them. Printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. For tis your thoughts that now must deck our king. Carry them here and there. Jumping o'er times. Turning the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit us chorus, chorus to this history. Who prologue like your humble patients pray. Gently to hear, kindly to judge, our play. My gracious father, you won the crown, wore it, kept it, gave it me. Then plain and right must my possession be, which I, with more than with a common pain, gainst all the world, will rightfully maintain. speaks war, you shall hear a fearful battle rendered you in music. Just he has addiction to cause his vein, his company unlettered, rude and shallow. If Prince Harry becomes king, you might as well have full staff on the throne. Can he step out from his father's shadow? Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. This is our chance to get our self-confidence mm -hmm. back as a country, to stand up yes. and be who we are, and I think England should um, take it. Thank you, that was... Presume not that I'm the thing I was.
Lose track of the hours, they blur into one If nobody's counting, the night's always young But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. The king is full of grace and fair regard. And a true lover of the holy church. The courses of his youth promised it not. His hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness, mortified in him, seemed to die too. We are blessed in the change. <laughs> but how now for mitigation of this bill urged by the commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent. Or rather swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. For I have made an offer to his majesty. Upon our spiritual convocation and in regard of causes now in hand, which I have opened to his grace at large, as touching France to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to his predecessors part with all. And how did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty, save that there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, the severals and unhidden passages of his true titles to some certain dukedoms, and generally to the crown and seat of France. 
derived from Edward, his great-grandfather. What was the impediment that broke this off? <laughs> the French ambassador upon that instant craved audience. And the hour, I think, is come to give him hearing and to know his embassy. Where is my lady Canterbury? Not here in presence. Send for her. Shall we call in the ambassador, my liege? Not yet, my good Cambridge. We will be resolved before we hear him of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us and France. God and his angels guard your sacred throne and make you long become it. <laughs> sure, we thank you. <laughs> My learned lady, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law, Salic, that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. Then hear me, gracious sovereign. <laughs> there is no bar to make against your highness' claim to France but this, which they produce from Faramont. No woman shall succeed in Salic land which Salic land the French unjustly closed to be the realm of France. <laughs> Yet their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany. Between the floods of Sala and of Elba, <laughs> then doth it well appear that Salic law was not devised for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic land until 401 and 20 years after defunction of King Faramond, idly supposed the founder of this law. King Pepin, which supposed Childric did as heir general, being descended of Blithield, which was daughter to King Clothair, make claim and title to the crown of France. Hugh Capet also, usurped the crown of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, Sole heir male of the true line and stock of Charles the Great could not keep quiet in his conscience wearing the crown of France till satisfied that fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was the lineal of the Lady Ermengar. Daughter to Charles, the foresaid Duke of Lorraine, by the which marriage the line of Charles the Great was reunited to the crown of France. So that as clear as is the summer's sun. All appear to hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France and to this day. How be it they would hold up this salic law to bar your highness claiming from the female. May I with right and conscience make this claim. <laughs> the sin upon my head, dread sovereign. For in the book of Numbers is it writ, when the man dies, let the inheritance descend unto the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flags. Yes, yes. Look back into your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread Lord, to your great grandsire's tomb, from whom you claim invoke their warlike spirit <laughs> and your great uncles edward the black prince who on the french ground played a tragedy making defeat on the full power of france await remembrance of these valiant dead and with your puissant armor and knew their feats you are their heir your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself as did the former lions of your blood. Never, King of England, have nobles richer and more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of... Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, yes. with blood and sword and fire to win your right! <clears throat> in aid whereof, we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum, as never did the clergy bring in at one time to any of your ancestors. Calling the ambassador, send from the Dauphin. 
Now, we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our oar. We'll break it all to pieces. Morning. Good morning. Now, are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin? Your Highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the Prince, our master, says that you savour too much of your youth and bids you be advised there's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you, meter for your spirit, this ton of treasure, and in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasure, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. We are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. His present and your pains we thank you for. <laughs> when we've matched our rackets to these balls, we will, in France, by God's grace, play a set. Shall strike his mother's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France will be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well, how he comes over us with our wilder days, not measuring what use we made of them. We never valued this poor seat of England, and therefore living hence to give ourselves to barbarous license. As tis ever common, men are merriest when they are from home. But, tell the Dauphin I will keep my state. Be like a king, and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that I have laid by my majesty and plodded like guys. a man for working days. But I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. And tell the pleasant prince this mock of his turn his balls to gunstones. His soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands. Mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But all this lies within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you, the Dauphin, I am coming on, to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get ye hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin, his jest will shave a bit of shallow wit thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey him with safe conduct. Fare ye well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, Admit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition. For we now have no thought in us but France. <laughs> now, all the youth of England are on fire! Ooh. And silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now, thrive the armourers. And honour's thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings, with winged heels as English mercuries. For now sits 
Expectation in the air. And hides a sword from hilts and to the point with crowns imperial. Crowns and coronets. Promise to Harry and his followers. Good morrow, Lieutenant Birdolf. What, are pistoling you friends yet? For my part, I care not. I say little. But when time shall serve, ah, uh, there shall be smiles. But that shall be as it may. I dare not fight. But I will wink and hold out mine iron. It's a simple one, but what though? It will toast cheese, and it will endure colder than the man's sword will, and there is an end. I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends. And we'll be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so, good Corporal Nim. Faith, I will live so long as I may. That's the certain of it. And when I cannot live any longer, I will do as I may. That is my rest. That is the rendezvous of it. It is certain, Corporal, that he is married to Nell quickly. And certainly she did you wrong, for you were troth plight to her. Oh, yeah. Here comes Pistol. And his wife. Good corporal, be patient here. How now, mine host, pistol? Base tyke. Course thou me host. By my hand, I swear I scorn the term. Nor shall my nail keep lodgers. No, by my truth. Not long. But we cannot lodge and board a dozen or fourteen gentlewomen that live honestly by the prick of their needles. But it will be thought we keep a bawdy house straight. <laughs> well, a day, lady. If he be not drawn now, we shall see willful adultery and murder committed. <laughs> <laughs> good lieutenant, good corporal, offer nothing here. Pish, pish for thee, Iceland dog, thou prick eared cur of Iceland. Good corporal, Nim, show thy valour and pull up your sword. Oh, will you shog off? Would have you soulless, soulless, egregious dog, O oh, viper vile, the soulless in thy most mervainous face, the soulless in thy teeth, and in thy throat, and in thy hateful lungs, yea, and in thy more purdy, and, which is worse, within thy nasty mouth. <laughs> I do retort the soulless in thy bowels, for I can take. And Pistol's cock is up, and flashing fire will follow. Hey, I'm not barbarous, and you cannot conjure me. I have a humour to knock you indifferently well. If you grow foul with me, Pistol, I will scour you with my rapier, as I may, in fair terms. If you'd walk off, I'd prick your guts a little, as I may, in fair terms, and that's the humour of it. Oh, bragger vile, and damn furious wife, the grave doth gape. And doting death is near, therefore, exhale. Oh. Oh. Hear me, hear me what I say. He that strikes the first stroke, I'll run him up to the else, as I am a soldier. An oath of mickle might and fury shall obey. Come, give me thy fist, thy forefoot to me give. Hey <laughs> Thy spirits are most tall. I will cut thy throat one time or other in fair terms. That's the humour of it. <laughs> <laughs> I thee defy again, O oh, hound. Thinks thou my spouse to get? No. To the hospital go, and from the powder and tub of infamy. Fetch forth the laser kite of Cressid's kind. <laughs> Dole tells you <laughs> by name and her espouse. I have and will hold the quantum quickly for the only she and Porco. There's enough go to. <laughs> <laughs>
these days. For the king has killed his art. Good husband, come home presently. Come. Shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives? To cut one another's throats. You pay me the eight shillings, I one of you at betting. Oh. Base is a slave that pays. That no, I will have. That's the humour of it. As mannered shall compound. Push on. Try this sword. He that makes the first thrust, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll kill him. By this sword, I will. The sword is an oath, and oaths must have their course. Corporal Nim, and thou wilt be friends. Be friends, and thou wilt not. Why then be enemies with me too? Prithee, put up. I shall have my eight shillings. I want of you at Betton. A noble shalt thou have, and present pay, and liquor likewise will I give to thee, and friendship shall combine and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim, and Nim shall live by me. Is not this just? For I shall suffer be unto the camp, and profits will accrue. Come, give me thy hand. I shall have my noble in cash, most justly paid. Well, then that's the humour of it, then. <laughs> As ever you came of women, coming quickly to Sir John. Poor Art, he is so shaked to the burning quotidian tertian that is most lamentable to behold. Sweet men, come a full staff. King hath run bad humours in a night that's the even of it. Nim now spokes the right. His heart is fractured and corroborate. King is a good king, but it must be as it may. He passes some humours and careers. Let us condole the night. For Lampkins, we will live. The French advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy, seek to divert the English purposes. Oh, England, model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart. <laughs> what mightest thou do? That honour would thee do were all thy children kind and natural. But see, by fault, France in thee hath found out a nest of hollow bosoms, which she fills with treacherous crowns, and three corrupted souls, one Cambridge, and the second, Scroop of Masham, and the third, Sir Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland, have for the guilt of France, <laughs> guilt indeed, confirmed conspiracy with fearful France. The sum is paid, the traitors are agreed. The king is set from London, and the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. Captain Gower. Sir. Poor God, His Grace is bold to trust these traitors. They shall be apprehended by and by. How smooth and even they do bear themselves, as if allegiance in their bosoms sat, crowned with faith and constant loyalty. <laughs> now sits the wind fair, we will aboard. Think you not, friends? that the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France, doing the execution and the act for which we haven't heard assembled them. No doubt, my liege, if each soldier do his best. Ah, I <laughs> doubt not that. Never was monarch better feared and loved than is your majesty. There's not, I think, a subject who sits in heart, grief and uneasiness under the sweet shade of your government. True. Those that were your father's enemies have steeped their gauze in honey and do serve you with hearts great of duty and of zeal. We therefore have great cause of thankfulness. 
and shall forget the office of our hand sooner than quittance of desert and merit according to the weight and worthiness. So service shall with steel its sinews toil, and labour shall refresh itself with hope to do your grace incessant services. We judge no less. Uncle of Exeter, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on, and on his more advice, we pardon him. That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. Let us yet be merciful. So may your majesty, and yet punish too. You show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. <sighs> Alas, your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. <laughs> And now, to our French causes, who are the late commissioners. I won, my lord. Your highness bade me ask for it today. So did you me, my liege. And I, my royal sovereign. Then, my lady Cambridge, there is yours. There is yours, Scroop of Masham. And most dear Grey of Northumberland, this same is yours. Read them, and know I know your worthiness. Why, how now? What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? Look ye, how they change. Their cheeks are paper. I do confess my fault. And I do bid me to your highness's mercy. To, to which, which we all appeal. appeal. The mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame! To talk of mercy. See you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. My Lady Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord, to furnish her with all appurtenance belonging to her honor, and this woman hath for a few light crowns lightly conspired and sworn unto the practices of France to kill us here in Hampton. To the which this knight, no less for bounty bounteous than Cambridge, hath likewise sworn, but oh, what shall I say to thee, Scroop? The cruel, ingrateful, savage, an inhuman creature. Thou, to despair the key for all my counsels, the newest, the very bottom of my soul, that almost might have coined me into gold, wouldst thou practice on me for thy use? Can it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might hurt my finger? It is so strange that though the truth of it stands off as gross as black and white, my eye will scarcely see it. Oh! I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine, methinks, is like another fall of man. Their faults are open. Arrest them to the answer of the law. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Lady of Cambridge. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Lady Scroop of Masham. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. My royal sovereign! Ah. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter. Touching our person, seek we no revenge, but we, our kingdom's safety, must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. Get you therefore hence, poor, miserable wretches. To your death. Bear them hence.
Now, soldiers for France, the enterprise world shall be to you as us, like glorious. We doubt not of a fair and lucky war since God has so graciously brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. We doubt not now, but every rub is smooth and on our way. Then forth, dear countrymen, let us deliver our puissance into the hand of God, putting it straight in expedition. Cheerly to air, the signs of war advance. No king of England, if not king of France. heart doth grieve. Bardolf, be blithe. Nim, rouse thy vaunt in veins. Boy, bristle thy courage up. For full staff he is dead. Would I were with him. Where some air he is, either in heaven or in hell. <laughs> Nay, sure. He's not in hell. He's in King Arthur's bosom. If ever a man went to Arthur's bosom, he went away and made a finer hand than had been any Christian child. He parted even just between twelve and one. Now, now, Sir John, quoth I, what man, be a good cheer. So he cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Now I to comfort him, bid him he should not think of God. I hope there was no need to trouble himself with any such thoughts yet. So he bade me lay more clothes on his feet. I put my hand into the bed and felt them, and they were as cold as any stone. Then I felt to his knees, and they were as cold as any stone. And so upward and upward and all was as cold as any stone. They say he cried out sack. Aye, <laughs> <laughs> that he did. And the women, <laughs> nay, that he did not. Yes, that he did. And he said they were devils incarnate. <laughs> he could never abide carnation. Twas a colour he never liked. He said once the devil would have him about women. Mm. He did in some sort, indeed, handle women. But then he was rheumatic and talked to the whore of Babylon. Do you not remember? He saw a flea stick upon Bardolph's nose, and he said it was a black soul burning in hellfire. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fuel is gone that maintained that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Shall we shog? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come, let's away. My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Let senses rule. The word is pitch and pay. Trust none. Go, clear thy crystals. Yoke fellows in arms! Let us to France, like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck, the very blood to suck. And that's but some unwholesome food, they say. Touch your soft mouth and march. Farewell, hostess. I cannot kiss 
That's the humor of it. But it's you. Let housewifery appear. <laughs> Keep close. By the command. Tell the pleasant prince this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and that his son shall stand sword charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons. Mock castles down, and some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But all this lies within the will of God, to whom I do appeal, and in whose name tell you, the Dauphin, I am coming on, to avenge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. to answer royally in our defences. Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch to line and you repair our towns of war with men of courage and with means defendant. For England, his approaches makes as fierce as waters to the sucking of a gulf. Therefore, it fits us then to be as provident, as fear may teach us out of late examples left by the fatal and neglected English upon our field. My most redoubted mother, it is most meet we arm us against the foe. For peace itself should not so dull a kingdom, though war nor no known quarrel were in question, but that, but that defenses, musters, preparations should be maintained, assembled and collected as were a war in expectation. Therefore I say, it is meet we all go forth to view the sick and feeble parts of France. And let us do it with no show of fear. No, with no more than if we heard that England were busied with a, a, a Whitson Morris dance. Oh. For my good liege, she is so idly kinged. Her scepter, so fantastically born by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fear attends us not. Oh, oh. peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question, your grace, the late ambassador, with what great state I heard their embassy. How well supplied with noble counsellors, how modest in exception, and withal, how terrible in constant resolution. And you shall find his vanities forspent were but the outside of the Roman Brutus, covering discretion with a coat of folly, as gardeners do with ordia hide those roots which first spring the most delicate. <laughs> well, tis not so, my Lord High Constable. Though we think it so, tis no matter. In cases of defence, tis best to oh. weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. <laughs> so the proportions of defence are filled, which offer weak or niggardly projection, doth like a miser spoil his coat with scanting a little cloth. Think we, King Harry Strong? And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us, and he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. A witness, our too much memorable shame, when Cressy battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captived by the hand of that black name Edward, uh. black prince of Wales, that whilst his mountain sire on mountain standing up in the air, crowned with the golden sun, saw his heroical seed and smiled to see him mangle the work of nature 
and deface the pattern set by God and by French fathers had 20 years been made. This is a stem of that victorious stock. And let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. We'll give them present audience. Go and bring them. Well, you see? This chase is hotly followed, friend. Turn head and stop pursuit. For coward dogs most spend their mouths when what they seem to follow runs far before them. Good, my sovereign, take up the English short. And let them know of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother, England. From him, and thus he greets your majesty. <laughs> he wills you in the name of God Almighty that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations long to him and to his heirs, namely the crown and all wide stretched honors that pertain by custom and the ordinance of times unto the crown of france that you may note is no sinister nor no awkward claim picked from the wormholes of long vanished days nor from the dust of old oblivion raked he sends you this most memorable line in every branch truly demonstrative Willing you overlook this pedigree, that when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he wills you then resign your crown and kingdom, indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. Hmm? For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore, in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel, and bids you in the bowels of the Lord deliver up the crown, and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting too. For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother England. Hmm. Uh, for the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What to him from England? Scorn and defiance. Oh. Slight regard, contempt, and any thing that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth prize you at. Thus says my king, and if your mother's highness do not, in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second accent of his ordinance. Say, if my mother render fair return, it is against my will. For I desire nothing but odds with England. Uh, to that end, as matching to his youth and vanity, I do present him with a Paris bull. He'll make your Paris louvre shake for it, were it the mistress court of mighty Europe. And be assured you'll find a difference, as we his subjects have in wonder found between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he weighs time, even to the utmost grain. That you shall read in your own losses if he stay in France. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent. Dispatch us with all speed, lest that our king come here himself to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. 
You shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A knight is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of this consequence. With imagined wing, our swift scene flies. In motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Follow. Follow and leave your England as dead midnight. Still. Guarded with grandsires, babies, and old women, either past or not arrived to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing hair? that will not follow these cold and choice-drawn cavaliers to France. Work, work your thoughts, and daring see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages, with fatal mouths gaping at girded Harfleur. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back and tells Harry that the queen doth offer him Catherine, her daughter, and with her to dowry some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The, the offer, offer likes not. And the nimble gunner, with lynchstock now the devilish cannon touches. And down goes all before them. Still, be kind and eat out our performance with your mind. to the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favoured rage. Mm. Then, lend the eye a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. Let the brow overwhelm it as fearfully as doth a gall at Rocco hang and jutty his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. Ah! <laughs> on, on, you noblest English. Dishonour not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you call fathers did forget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let's swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand, like greyhounds in the slip, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge cry, God for Harry, England, and St. John! Does a bow and the plain song is just drop. Oh, it's coming home, it's coming home, it's coming. France is coming home. Oh, would I were in an alehouse in England? I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. And I. Oh, tell them, oh, preach, you dogs! Oh, Come on, you Kellyans! Oh, oh, be merciful, Duke, to great men of mould. <laughs> Good boy, can't bait thy rage. Use lenity, sweet sir. Get up there. Go. As young as I am, I have observed these free swashers. Right. I 
and boy to them all free, but all they free, though they would serve me, could not be man to me, for indeed free such antics do not amount to a man. For Bardolf, she... <laughs> she is white-livered and red-faced. By the means whereof, she faces out, uh, but fights not. For Pistol... Pistol! 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 Oh, he hath a killing tongue. <laughs> but a quiet sword, by the means whereof he breaks words, but keeps whole weapons. And for a nim, well... Ow! <laughs> See, he hath heard that men of few words are the best men, and therefore he scorns to say his prayers, lest he should be thought a coward. But his few bad words are as matched with his few good deeds, for he never broke any man's head but his own. And that was against a post when he was drunk. I mean, they will steal anything and call it purchase. Bardov stole a loot case, bore it 12 leagues, and then sold it for three halfpence. Nim and Bardov are sworn brothers in Filchin, and in Calais they stole a fire shovel. A fire shovel. I mean, I knew by that piece of service that the men would carry coals. If they would have me as familiar with men's pockets as their gloves or their handkerchiefs, which makes much against my manhood if I should take from another's pocket and put into mine, for it is plain pocketing up a wrongs. I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore I must cast it up. of it is not sufficient. For look you, the adversary you may discuss unto the Duke, oh, look you, has digged himself for yet under the countermind. By Jesu, I think he will blow up all if there's not better directions. The Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, mm. is altogether directed by an Irishman. <laughs> A very valiant gentleman, he thinks. There is Captain McMorris, is it not? Ah, I believe it is. By Jesu, he is an ass, as in the world. I will verify as much in his beard. He has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars, uh, look you, of the Roman disciplines, than is a puppy dog. <laughs> For the ten cent of barley! <laughs> <laughs> Now yet resolves the governor of the town. This is the latest power we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. Or, oh, like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best. If I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved half-fleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy will be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand shall range with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people, whilst yet my soldiers are in my command. Was it the cool and temperate wind of grace air blows the filthy and contagious cloud of heady murder, spoil, and villainy? If not, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill, shrieking daughters? Your fathers, 
taken by their silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes while the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? Our expectation hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom of succors we entreated, returns us that his powers are not yet ready to raise so great a siege. Therefore, great king, we yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we are no longer defensible. Open your gates. Go, you, Uncle Exeter, enter Harfleur, there remain and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, the winter coming on and sickness growing amongst our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. Tonight in Harfleur will be your guest. Tomorrow for the march shall we address. Tu parles le langage Un peu, sir. Je te prie, monseigneur. Il faut que j'apprenne à parler. Comment t'appelez-vous la main en anglais La main oui. Il est pli de hand. De hand. Et le doigt Le doigt oui. oh, Ma foi, j'ai oublié le doigt. Mais je me souviendrai. Le doigt. Uh, je pense que sont appelés de fingers. Oui, de fingers. La main, de hand. Les doigts, de fangre. Hein? Je pense que je suis un bon écolier. Je gagne du monde anglois vite. Hmm? Comment appelez-vous les ongles? Les ongles, nous les appelons de nails. De nails. Écoutez. Dites-moi si je parle bien. De hand, de fangre et de nail. C'est bien dit, madame. Mm -hmm. Il est faux bon gloire. Mm -hmm. Dites-moi donc gloire pour le bras. De arm, madame. Et le cul. De elbow. D'elbow. Elbow. D'elbow, oui. Je m'en fais la répétition de tout le mot que vous m'avez appris dès à présent. Euh, il est trop difficile, Catherine, comme je pense. <rire> Excusez-moi, écoutez. De hand, de fangre, de nail, de arme, de bilbo. De elbow. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie d'elbo. <rire> Comment appelez-vous le col De neck. De neck. Et le menton De chin. Le col de Nick. Le menton de Sin. Oui, de votre honneur, en vérité, vous prononcez les mots si droit qu'à la native d'Angleterre. Oh. Je ne doute pas de prendre par la grâce de Dieu et un peu de temps. Euh, N'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vous ai enseigné? <rire> non, je réciterai vous promptement. Allez. De hand, de fangre, de maille, de nails, de nails, de arme, d'elbow. C'est votre honneur, de elbow. Oh, si tu joues de elbow. De neck <rire> et de chin. Comment appelez-vous le pied et la robe? Hein? De foot, madame. Oui. Elle a cunt. De foot et de cunt. <rire> Seigneur Dieu, c'est ce mot qui est mauvais. Corruptible, gros, 
et un bouddhique, et n'importe les dames d'honneur du Zé. Je ne voudrais prononcer ces mots devant le Seigneur de France pour tout le monde. Faux De faux et de... <rire> oh, ni en moi. Je résisterai une autre femme à le son ensemble. De Inde, de Fangre, de Nile, de Arme, de Lebo, de Nek, de Sin, de Foot et de Kun. Excellent, sister. It is certain he hath passed the river Song. And if he be not fought with all, my lady, let us not live in France. Oh. Let us quit all and give our vineyards to a barbarous people. Oh, Dieu de vin. Shall a few sprays of us, the emptying of our mother's luxury, our scions put in wild and savage stock, spurt up so suddenly into the clouds, and oh, look, their grafters, Dieu de bataille. Where have they this metal? Is not their climate foggy, raw and dull, on whom, as in despite, the sun looks pale, killing their fruit with frowns? Can sodden water that drench for surrained jades, their barley broth, decoct their cold blood to such valiant heat? And shall our quick blood, spirited with wine, seem frosty? Oh, for honour of our land, let us not hang like roping icicles upon our houses' thatch, whilst a more frosty people sweat drops of gallant youth in our rich fields. Normans. But bastard Normans, Norman bastards. By faith and honour, our madams mock at us. And plainly say our metal is bred out, and they will give their bodies to the lust of English youth, to new store France with bastard warriors. Silence! Up, princes! <laughs> and with spirit and honor edged more sharper than your swords tied to the field. Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land, with pennons painted in the blood of Harfleur. Rush on his host. As doth the melted snow upon the valleys, whose low vassal seat the Alps doth spit and void his room upon. Go down upon him. You have power enough. And in a captive chariot, into Rouen, bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I his numbers are so few. <laughs> his soldiers, sick and famished in their march. But I am sure when he shall see our armies, he'll drop his heart into the sink of fear and for achievement offer us his ransom. Well, therefore, Lord Constable, to England fast, to see what willing ransom he will give. Prince Dauphin, you will stay with us in Rouen. And not so, I do beseech your majesty. Be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Duke Orléans, and princes all, and quickly bring us news of England's fall. Beseech thee do me favours. The Duke of Exeter doth love thee well. Aye, I praise God. And I have merited some love at his hands. Bardolph. A soldier. Firm and of sound heart and of buxom valour hath by cruel fate. And giddy fortune's furious fickle wheel that goddess Blind that stands upon the rolling rest of stone. By your patience, Lieutenant Pistol. Fortune is painted blind with a muffler afore her eyes to signify to you that fortune is blind. Which could And she is painted also with a wheel to signify to you, which is the model of it, that she is turning an inconstant 
and mutability and variation. Which could all... And he fought. Look, you, is fixed upon a spherical stone, which rolls and rolls and rolls. In good truth, the poet makes the most excellent description of it. Fortune is an excellent model. Fortune is Bardolph's foe <laughs> and frowns on her. That Wait. she... That she has stolen a pax and executed must she be. Hmm. Exeter hath given the doom of death. Therefore, go speak. The Duke will hear thy voice. And let not Bardo's vital thread be cut with edge of penny cord and vile reproach. Speak, Captain, for her life, and I will thee require. Lieutenant Pistol! I do partly understand your meaning. Why then rejoice therefore? Well, certainly, it is not a thing to rejoice at. For if, look you, she were my sister, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put her to execution. For discipline ought to be used. Well, die and be damned, and Figo for thy friendship. It is well. The figure's spade. Very good. Uh, this is an arrant counterfeit rascal. Uh, I'll assure you, he uttered as brave words at the bridge as you shall see in a summer's day. Why, tis a fool, a gull, a rogue, that now and then goes to the wars to grace himself at his return into England under the form of a soldier. I tell you what, Captain Gower, I do perceive he is not the man that he would gladly make show to the world he is. Huh. If I find a hole in his coat, I will tell him my mind. Huh. Hark you, the king oh. is coming, and I must speak with him. God bless your majesty. How now, Fluellen? Himself from the bridge. I so please your majesty. The Duke of Exeter has very gallantly maintained the bridge. The French is gone off. I can tell your majesty, the duke is a brave man. What men have you lost, Fluellen? The perdition of the adversary hath been very great, a reasonable great. Marry, for my part, I think the duke hath lost never a soldier. <laughs> but one that is like to be executed for robbing a church. One Bardolf. If your majesty know the woman. We would have all such offenders so cut off. I give express charge that on our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. <clears throat> Sir! What shall I know of thee? My queen's mind, unfold it. Thus says my queen, say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but sleep. 
Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him that we could have rebuked him at half fleur, but that we thought not God to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him therefore consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested. To this, add defiance, and tell him in conclusion that he hath betrayed his followers. His condemnation is pronounced. No! Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy queen I do not seek her now. Could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment, for, to say the sooth, it is no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and advantage. My people, with sickness much enfeebled, my numbers lessened, and those few I have almost no better than so many French, who, when they were in health, I tell thee, I thought upon one pair of English legs did march three Frenchmen. Yet forgive me, God, that I do brag thus, this your heir of France hath blown that vice in me. I must repent. Go, therefore, and tell thy queen, here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk. My aunt, the weak and sickly guard, yet God before, tell her we will come on. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are, we say we will not shun it. I shall deliver so. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hands, uncle, not theirs. Beyond the river we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow, bid them march away. Okay, I'm live here with Aaron Sidwell, who is sat at home. You were our Henry. Okay, I'm live here with Aaron Sidwell, who is sat at home. You were our Henry. How was it? Uh, unbelievable. Um, it, it was the biggest challenge of my career. It was the biggest adventure of my career. It was just hard to sum up the whole process, I think, in, in, in just a few short words, but it was truly an incredible process. We had a, an interesting round of auditions with you as well. Um, it was 
so clear to see that you were so hungry for this role and mm. uh, and for this role and mm. and I couldn't believe that you just walked into the first round and you delivered some of the most epic speeches in Shakespeare <laughs> history off the cuff like that I came in wanting to I, I and it's a, an audition kind of mentality that I have that I can't act while I've got the book in my hands so that has to be down that has to be second nature already and so getting that into into your body with something like this is is tough it really is tough because as you're saying we are talking about some of the most iconic speeches ever i said to kind of put everything to one side in terms of who i'd be up against who you know how, how prepared would somebody else be and just be as prepared as i could possibly be and make sure that my audition as it were was actually my performance you came across so well that you had such a clear image of how your henry versus any other Henry's was going to be different. Can you give the audience a little insight into how your performance differed to any others? Well, I can only speak for the ones that I've seen, but um, for me, I think that I wanted, I wanted the, my Henry to just really struggle to be a king. Um, I didn't want him to be this knowing leader i wanted him to be this unsure leader who who just happens to say and do all the right things um and i think that's more inspirational i think at times but i wanted him to be this this captain on a football pitch i wanted him to be this um uh this rallying kind of figure behind all these people but because he was so relatable to them because he was so relatable to absolutely everybody and anybody um and hal and i spent uh, a whole once we'd got down to sirencester because we rehearsed for two weeks in london and when we got down to sirencester we had this our first day and he just sort of turned around to the rest of the cast and was like i just need aaron for like two hours just everyone else just go away and we just worked on um a very pivotal moment for Henry, which comes towards the beginning of act, our, act, our second half, not act two, because obviously there's five acts in the play. Um, but our second half of the play, there's a really pivotal time for Henry where he doesn't leave the stage for quite a long time. And we see him go through various transitions. And working with Hal, particularly on something like that, it was was quite quite a unique experience for me. And And to say that whenever that guy picks up the phone now and asks me, uh, if I'm interested in doing something, the answer will always be yes. Should just tell you a testament as to mm -hmm. as to what it's like working with him. He's a an absolute visionary, and his um, 
his influence on this piece cannot be undermined in any single which way. You became a clan almost. And I think that even people in Sirencester were fearful of the Henry V clan. There were <laughs> clubs and pubs all over the place who were, who were worried about you guys. So tell, tell us yeah. a little bit about um, the spirit within the cast and the company. Well, very early on, we we had the idea that we wanted to create this um, this opening sequence that was a rave uh, to kind of fill you in on who Prince Hal was um, and what what Henry was leaving behind. And um, we had this idea and it developed and it started with us running around a rehearsal room and jumping off of walls and, and, and um, you know, kind of working on different uh, physical aspects with Christos, our um, our fight coordinator, and Kate, our movement director, and um, and and once we got down to science, we slowly developed the idea of uh, working with a masterful Ben Collins of the Barn uh, to film some footage and create this footage. And what happened is we just ended up going on a night out for all intents and purposes, uh, <laughs> but in character. I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was just the ultimate kind of um, method acting evening for every single actor in there. And the next day when we came into work, any barrier that there could and should maybe have been had gone. It was broken and everybody just felt so connected to the other person. And every single night, uh, in a very unique way, we, we all went on this journey together, eight of us, and it, there was just this this team effort and what you don't see on stage is um, the people running around backstage sort of helping each other with their costumes and then running onto stage, you know, uh, in another way or, or, or someone, you know, where, where I've just had blood all over my face running off stage, whipping off, trying to get into a three piece suit to go into a press conference. And, you know, Lauren Samuel sort of like wiping blood off my face for me as I go. And it, and it, and it, it really was just this. Um, just real family spirit, and, mm -hmm. and I include Emma Smith and, and, and Ari and Heidi Jo, um, who work backstage with us in that as well. The the team effort that went into creating the show was amazing, and 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 the respect of everyone's process of kind of like getting where they needed to be before the show, and little pre-show rituals that we had that you know would walk around to every single person before the show, and you've probably seen it um, beforehand in in the footage there of me just walking up to every single person and just giving them a hug and just wishing them a good show and then and then we go with our ooh to start the show. It'll be a, th a show that lives long in the memory for me and I'm so glad it's getting a chance to be streamed, the archive footage streamed live now and thank you to you folks, um, the company and the creatives and everyone involved who have given us the permission to do this. Uh, Aaron, you, you were an amazing Hal, Henry, Prince Hal. Um, and I'm so glad everyone's getting to see it. And I'm fingers crossed that one day we might be able to bring this production back. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's life in it still. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Aaron. Cheers, mate. Thank you. So we are now with our Princess Catherine and other parts. How many parts did you play in this production? Lauren. Oh God, no, Vast. Well, my obviously my two principal ones were uh, Princess Catherine, as you mentioned, and Boy. Boy. But I also played, um, who else did I play? Oh, my God, I think I played five in total. Now you've asked me and I can't remember any of the names, so that's good. I did get shot as basically all of them. That really helped having such an epic company to work with as well. It, it seemed to me, sitting on the outside, that the, the team effort in this was quite extraordinary. Yeah, you have to have a very trusting cast. Like, obviously, when you're doing things that are quite dangerous like that as well, you have to all be very trusting of each other and we all just worked so well together and we were such a small group all playing so many different roles of course apart from Aaron playing just the one very strong role um but yeah so it was a very big collective piece that you're exactly right and we all had each other's backs at all times it was great and did that help when uh, you were learning a new language Oh, yes, that's a small factor of Princess Catherine. <laughs> um, yeah, I did speak no French whatsoever before that role, um, I'd like to point out. So, yeah, it was just a really slow process as well for me. Like, I just thought the best thing to do was to phonetically learn every single word. So I wrote it all out um, on top of the script phonetically and then just very slowly got quicker and quicker and tried to sound 
more like I was actually French. <laughs> so yeah, everyone was very patient with me in rehearsals. And obviously when it's a language that you don't speak and you have a bit of a moment on stage where you forget it, there was times when I would just stare at Aaron going, uh, uh, and he would know that I had forgotten my line and then couldn't get myself out of my line because I can't actually speak French. So he was very helpful at getting me around that. And we also had a cast member, Matt, who um, was fluent in French, which was very helpful because he would pick me up on little things that I would get wrong in my pronunciation and things like that. But yeah, I felt very proud of myself that I managed to do that. <laughs> hey, I tell you what, it sounded pretty good to me, but I... <laughs> Can only speak, Welsh, you know, eh? I can speak two <laughs> languages, which is bad Welsh and pretty bad English. So, uh, well, yeah, you you're go. not going to get any complaints about your French from me. Um, <laughs> so, Shakespeare for you, um, I can imagine that it's not been something you've done an extensive amount, being sort of <clears throat> no. a stalwart in the musical theatre world. Is it something that you want to crack on and do a lot more of? Yeah, um, you're absolutely right. I've not done this is my first ever Shakespeare um, professionally. I'd obviously um, done it at drama school, and I also in my younger years did lots of Raja examinations and like that. So I'd explored Shakespeare, and I was very into it, but just never been given the opportunity to try it out. So I was absolutely thrilled when I got the role in Henry V because um, it's really something I think as actors and actresses that it, we want to get our teeth into at some point in our careers you want to go yes I was a Shakespeare did that I really enjoyed it and I loved it so much it is absolutely something I'd like to try again and hopefully in the future I will have the opportunity to me about Hal Chambers he's quite a unique director don't you think and he has yes. a very unique approach to Shakespeare Yes, exactly. You're exactly right with that. I was, do you know what? I feel incredibly blessed that Hal was our director because I was really nervous going into rehearsals. I thought everyone's going to be really hot on Shakespeare. I've never done it before. It's quite a, you know, a nerve wracking experience. And Hal was just absolutely brilliant from the start of just going, you know what? If you don't understand it, please, there are no stupid questions, that kind of thing. And we did lots of trust exercises to begin with, lots of games. We became very into four square. If you've not played it, it's very obsessive and a brilliant. Um, and yeah, he was just very good at making everybody really understand the text, which of course is so important with Shakespeare and really making it a big um, ensemble piece and making us all feel like a collective and making none of us feel scared or stupid in anything that we were doing. And yeah, I, I feel really, really lucky that Hal was our director. Mm. Yeah, it was an amazing team, a full team effort. And uh, another big part of this production was the music side of things. And in particular, yeah. <laughs> one part of it was uh, the epic rave scene. Yeah, that was the other thing about how I think as well at the start, we knew very quickly that this wasn't going to be just a normal production of uh, Henry V. You know, he wanted it to bring it modern and make everybody go, you know, you can relate to Shakespeare. And one of those big um, things was adding the music. So at the start of Henry V, I mean, we had epic music throughout, even during the war sequences. It was like, I just felt like such a badass in those sequences, like all the <laughs> slow motion and like, bosh, bosh, felt like I was in... Um, some sort of epic war film it was brilliant but yeah the right at the start we had this amazing rave scene to sort of set up henry's um background really and um, before he becomes king and yeah i actually ended up recording the vocals for that rave song you did which was very very fun With never harry... been on a rave song yeah well harry smith the composer and you should collaborate on more shows on more songs oh it's pretty pretty incredible well lauren yeah. thank you so much it's your birthday so happy it's birthday, birthday. <laughs> happy birthday to you i hope everyone watching the live stream wishes you a happy birthday although this is filmed the day before a belated it's happy birthday yeah. Um, so please, everyone at home, send Lauren lots of love and lots of presents. And Lauren, I'll just take a 10% commission on all those presents if that's okay. <laughs> thank you, Sean. Sure. Get that over to you, and Thank you. Thank you so much. Lauren, we will <laughs> chat to you soon. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. So I'm here now with Hal Chambers, the director of this epic production of Henry V. How are you, Hal? I'm all right, yeah. Yeah, I'm surviving. It's very, very nice weather, so we've managed to go out for a few walks to keep sane. You have one, um, one, one allocated walk per day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was in rehearsals for a show at the RSC as an assistant director, and uh, we got to, you know, many weeks into rehearsals. Just, just getting to that point where you're putting it all together, 
and then um, yeah, we're at home now, so it's mm. very surreal. Maybe this is an opportunity to reflect on some of the work that's gone by and to take uh, take a look at uh, some of the amazing work that you've already created, Hal. And this really was something very special. It was something very special for the barn. Um, and I, I'm interested to hear from your perspective, um, what what was it like to, uh, trying to reimagine this piece that is quite iconic, really, with regards to the histories and how it sits in um, modern culture. We've had some epic versions of Henry V on film or on stage, but your version was so incredibly unique. So tell us a little bit about it. Well, I suppose when we talked about doing the play, um, when, when I started re re researching back into it, um, Henry is well known for his epic speeches and his his sort of um, positive sense of uh, national pride in England. Um, but it sat, some of that sat a little bit strangely with me, a bit felt a bit, um, something didn't feel quite right with the way that the, some of the sentiments uh, in, in that play were being used um, to promote Brexit or right-wing right -wing extremism. Um, people like Tommy Robinson in the EDL website were, quoting Henry V and um, Nigel, Nigel Farage was trying to stir that sense of national pride. And, and, and so, I, I, you know, that, that question of what it was to be English, um, you know, this time last year was, was a, a really complicated um, thing to, to do, to kind of like try and understand. I think all of that um, really interplayed very interestingly when I was reading through the play and when I started talking to my designer, we, you know, Emily, we started really, it really started to feel like a very contemporary play, a play about a nation that was trying to reassert itself. And that's what Henry was doing when he took power. He was the son of a king killer. His father obviously involved in the murder of Richard II. And, and people weren't sure whether he really had the right to be a king. Mm -hmm. So he had to do something. He had to make a big um, a big decision and, and try and put his uh, sort of, um, you know, um, put his name on the map by taking on France. So, you know, here is a young king inspiring a nation to do something they're not exactly sure what they want to do, um, and that, that is to go to war with France. Well, we were in our own war with France, or if you like Europe, uh, this time last year, and um, it, in terms of some of the rhetoric that was flying around, it's very, very um, overblown, and it, it felt like the play um, really looked at how leaders can influence people and the way Henry has to do, um, you know, these famous speeches like the half fleur speech, uh, once more unto the breach, dear friends. And, you know, that, that speech is to a bunch of really, really tired soldiers who are absolutely sick of this siege that they've been doing in half fleur for weeks and weeks and weeks. And yet we, we take it out of context and we always see this as this really, you know, rallying speech. And it is an incredible speech, but um, it, it was to, in the context, it's like, it's desperate. It's like his desperate measures. All he has is his words. And the power of words. And then we look at the um, St. Crispin's Day speech. That is to a group of soldiers who know that they're outnumbered five to one and nobody really wants to do it. So Henry digs himself out of these scenarios by the use of his language. We need leadership now. And, um, you know, Henry was brilliant at, at galvanizing a nation. Um, whether his, whether his uh, you know, what he wanted behind all of that was... was um, it was kind of like legitimate or not, I don't know, because obviously he was doing a lot of that. That, that war was a lot of, about his ego, <laughs> his, mm. his relationship with his people. But when, when the going got tough, he could certainly deliver some really inspiring words. And um, I don't know if words will help at the moment, but um, it, it would certainly rally a nation to have a, a, a big speech, I think, right now. Well, I th I'm hoping that you just gave it. That was pretty inspiring stuff. So I'm... Um, <laughs> Again, just to say, Hal, um, thank you from on behalf of the Barn Theatre. We're going through a pretty tough time here at the moment. Um, but if it wasn't for your generosity in one, producing this and directing this show last year, and two, allowing us to show it to uh, the world on, on our social media stream. So thank you so much. Uh, we'd love to get you back here as soon as the RSC is done with you. Um, <laughs> or what other... Uh, big shows you've got coming, but um, at some point for sure, I'm determined that we may get uh, Henry V remounted or another exciting project. Great, yeah, absolute ditto. It was one of my favourite shows I've um, had the pleasure to do. So uh, it's a great theatre, and I really hope that you can weather this 
pretty brutal storm. I mean, the whole of, you know, the theatre land is, is, you know, just hoping this thing doesn't play out too long. And, and, and believe you me, if you're, you know, the barn is suffering, the globe are suffering. The globe are, mm. are not a, a supported by, by um, you know, government money. And they're really scared. And they're the globe. But they're yeah. going to have to cancel their entire season potentially, and they are. Well, there's you know they're in the law. Of, it doesn't take a mathematician to work out. Absolutely, that that's going to put them in a really perilous scenario. So I just really the, the industry's in this know, together. Get through it. I think uh, what I'm yeah. hoping is that um, solidarity and everyone working together can find a solution for all of us, and uh, you mm -hmm. know they, we'll get there. We'll get there. Once more, and yeah. to the breach, dear friends. Well, once more. Well, people are, people are going to need stories at the end of all of this. Yeah. They're going to need more than ever. And um, I wrote, I've been writing blogs for the ROC, and I said it's going to be a really bloody moving experience when we, if we do ever f open the Comedy of Errors in Stratford, mm. um, because the play is about re reunion. Really, it's about yeah. people who've been lost who are then brought back together. Um, it's, I'm going to shed a tear, man. It's going to be, I and mean, it's a comedy. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's going to be just just sitting in a room with other people again. Uh, I know it's early doors, but you know it, we don't know how long this thing's going to go on for, and. You know, what is theatre but our modern church, you know, bringing people together for communion, to try and understand ourselves, to try and look forward. And let's hope we can do that again soon. Yeah, well, for us at The Barn, it uh, already, um, we've been live streaming stuff for about a week and I'm sadly getting used to an empty house. Um, I'm hoping we can mm. change that very soon. Yeah, me too. Well, thank you very much, Hal. Um, we will catch up very soon. Cool. All the best. Cheers. Cheers. Excellent armour. Let my horse have his due. It huh? is the best horse of Europe. <sighs> Will it never be morning? My Lord of Orleon and my Lord High Constable. Uh, you talk of horse and armour. You're as well provided of both as any prince in the world. What a long night is this. <sighs> I will not change my horse with any that treads but on four pastons. <laughs> he bounds from the <laughs> earth as if his entrails were hairs. Le cheval volant. The Pegasus. Allez. Ah, oui. Cher la narine de faux. When I bestride him, <laughs> I saw I am a hawk. Ah! He trots the air. The earth sings when he touches it. The bassist horn of his hoof is more musical than the pipe uh, than the pipe of Hermes. He's of the colour of the nutmeg. And of the heat of the ginger. It is a beast for Perseus. He is pure air and fire. And the dull elements of earth and water never appear in him, but only in patient stillness. While his rider mounts him. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> he is indeed a horse. And all other jades you may call beasts. Indeed, my lord. This most absolute and excellent horse. <laughs> will it never be day? I will trot tomorrow a mile and my way shall be paved with English faces. I would not say so for fear I would be faced out of my way, but I would it were morning, for I would fain be about the ears of the English. Now who will go to hazard with me for 20 prisoners? Hmm? You must first go yourself to hazard, ere eh? you have them. <sighs> It is midnight. I will go arm myself. <laughs> He's simply the most active gentleman of France. Doing his activity, and he will still be doing. Oh, what a wretched and peevish fellow is this king of England. Oh. To mope with his fat-brained followers so far out of his knowledge. If oh. the English had any apprehension, they would run away. That they lack. For if their heads had any intellectual armour, they could never wear such heavy headpieces. <laughs> Foolish curs that run winking into the mouth of a Russian bear and have their heads crushed like rotten apples. <laughs> you may as well say 
That's a valiant flea that dare eat his breakfast on the lip of a lion. And the men, <laughs> they do sympathise with the mastiffs in robustious <laughs> and rough coming on, <laughs> leaving their wits with their wives. <sighs> and then give them great meals of beef and iron and steel. They will eat like wolves and fight like devils. Aye. But these English are shrewdly out of beef. Then shall we find tomorrow they have stomachs only to eat and none to fight. <laughs> now, is it time to arm? Come, shall we about it? Ah, it's now two o'clock, but let me see. By ten, we shall have each a hundred English men. <laughs> <laughs> conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. Oh. Ooh. From camp to camp through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds. Oh, a nice one, Chris. <laughs> that the fixed sentinels all must receive the secret whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. And through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. The country cocks do crawl, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning named. Proud of their number and secure in soul, the confident and all lusty French do the low-rated English play at dice <laughs> and chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight who, like a foul and ugly witch, doth limp so tediously away. The poor condemned English, like sacrifices, by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger, and their gesture sad, investing lank, lean cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh, now! Who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band? Walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. For forth he goes and visits all his hosts, bids them good morrow with a modest smile and calls them brothers, friends and countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note how dread an army <laughs> hath enrounded him, nor doth he dedicate one jot of colour and to the weary and all watched night, but freshly looks and overbears a taint with cheerful semblance and sweet majesty, that every wretch pining and pale before, beholding him, plucks courage from his looks. Thawing cold fear, that mean and gentle all behold, as may unworthiness defy, a little touch of Harry in the night. <laughs> and so, our scene must to the battle fly. Where? Oh, for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils. Right ill disposed and brawl ridiculous. The name of Agincourt. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockeries be. Uncle Exeter, it is true we are in great danger. The greater, therefore, should our courage be. Lend me thy cloak, uncle. Shall I attend your grace? No, my good Exeter. I and my bosom must debate a while. Then I would no other company. Well, the Lord in heaven bless thee, noble Harry. God a mercy, old heart. Thou speakest cheerfully. Discuss unto me. Art thou officer? Art thou base, common, and popular? I'm a gentleman of a company. Trailest thou the piss on pike? Even so, what are you? As good a gentleman as the emperor. Then you're better than the king. 
The king's a boarcock and a heart of gold. A lad of life, an imp of fame, of parents good and fist most valiant. I kiss his dirty shoe. And from heart string, I love the lovely bully. What is thy name? Harry. Leroy. Leroy? Cornish name. Art thou of a Cornish crew? No, I'm a Welshman. Knowest thou Flewellen? Yes. Well, tell her I'll knock my leak about a pate upon St. Davy's Day. Do not wear your dagger in your cap that day, lest she knock that about yours. Art thou her friend? And her kinsman, too. Ah, oh, well, the fee go for thee, then. I oh, thank you. God be with you. My name is Pistol Called. It sorts well with your fierceness. Oh, Captain Fluellen! So, in the name of Jesus Christ, speak lower! It is the greatest admiration of the universal world when the true and ancient prerogatives and laws of the wars is not kept. If you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, uh. you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle tottle or pibble pabble in Pompey's camp. I warrant you, you shall find the ceremonies of the wars and the cares of it and the forms of it and the sobriety of it and the modesty of it to be otherwise. Why, the enemy is loud. Ugh. You hear him all night. If the enemy is an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb, is it me to think you that we should also lock you be an ass and a fool and a prating coxcomb in your own conscience now? I will speak lower. I pray you and beseech you that you do. Though it appear a little out of fashion, there is much care and valour in this Welsh woman. Williams, Captain Gower. Oi. Is not that the morning which breaks yonder? Oh, I think it be, Williams. <laughs> but we have no great cause to desire the approach of day. We see yonder the beginning of the day. But I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? Your friend. Under what captain serve you? Under Sir Thomas Erpingham. A good old commander and a most kind gentleman. I pray you, what thinks he of our estate? I am. Even as men wrecked upon a sand that are to be washed off the next time. He hath not told his thought to the king. No. Nor is it not meet he should. For though I speak it to you, I think the king is but a man as I am. <laughs> the violet smells to him as it doth to me. The element shows to him as it doth to me. All his senses have but human conditions. His ceremonies lay by. In his nakedness, he appears but a man. And though his affections are higher mounted than ours, yet when they stoop, they stoop with the like wing. Therefore, when he sees reason to fear, as we do, his fears, out of doubt, be of the same relish as ours are. Yet no soldier should possess him with any appearance of fear, lest he, by doing so, should dishearten his army. He may show what outward courage he will, but I believe, as cold a night as tis, he could wish himself in Thames up to the neck. <laughs> and so I would he were, Ooh. and I by him at all adventures, so we were quit here. By my troth, I will speak my conscience of the king. I do not think he would wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I would he were here alone. Ho, ho. So should he be sure to be ransomed and a many poor soldiers lives saved. I dare say you love him not so ill to wish him here alone. However so you speak this to feel other men's minds. Methinks I could not die anywhere so contented as in the king's company. His cause being just and his quarrel honourable. That's more than we know. Aye, or more than we should seek after. For we know enough if we know we are the king's subjects. If his cause be wrong, our obedience to the king wipes the crime of it out of us. But if the cause be not good, the king himself hath a heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads, chopped off in battle, shall join together at the latter day and cry all, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, 
Some upon their wives and husbands, left poor behind them. Some upon the debts they owe. Some upon their children, royally left. I am feared there are few that die well in a battle. For how can they charitably dispose of anything when blood is their argument? Now, if these men do not die well, it will be a black matter for the king that led them to it, whom to disobey were against all proportion of subjection. Oh, so, if a son, who is by his father's, sent about merchandise to sinfully miscarry upon the sea, the imputation of his wickedness, by your rule, should be imposed upon the father that sent him. But, <laughs> but this is not so. The king is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, nor the father of his son, for they purpose not their death when they purpose their services. Every subject's duty is the king's, but every subject's soul is his own. Therefore, should every soldier in the wars do as every sick man in his bed, wash every moat out of his conscience, and dying so, death is to him advantage, or not dying. The time is blessedly lost wherein such preparation was gained, for in him that escapes, if it were not a sin to think that. Making God so free an offer, he let him outlive that day to see his greatness, and to teach others how they should prepare. Tis certain, everyone who dies ill, the ill upon his own head. The king is not to answer it. But I do not desire that he should answer for me. And yet, I determined to fight lustily for him. I myself, at the king's say, would not be ransomed. Aye, he said so to make us fight cheerfully. Ah. But when our throats are cut, he may be ransomed, we near the wiser. If I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. You pay him then. That's a perilous shot out of an elder gun that a poor and private displeasure can do against a monarch. You may as well go about to turn the sun to ice with fanning in his face with a peacock's feather. You'll never trust his word after. Come! Hey, it is a foolish saying. Your proof is something too round. I should be angry with you if the time were convenient. Let it be a quarrel between us if you live. I embrace it. How shall I know thee again? Give me any gauge of thine. I'll wear it in my hat. Then, if thou darest acknowledge it, I'll make it my quarrel. Here is my glove. Give me another of thine. There. This will I also wear in my cap. If ever thou comes to me again after tomorrow and says, this is my glove, by this hand I will take thee a box on the hey, ear. Hey, if I live to see it, I will challenge you. Thou darest as well be hanged. Do so. I take thee in the king's company. Keep thy word. Fare thee well. I'll be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have French quarrels in all, if you could tell how to reckon. Upon the king, let us our lives, our souls, our debts, our careful wives, our children, and our sins lay on the king. We must bear all. Oh, charged condition, twin born with greatness, subject to the breath of every fool. What infinite heart ease must kings neglect that private men enjoy? And what have kings? The privates have not two, save ceremony, save general ceremony. And what art thou, thou idle ceremony? What drinks thou off instead of homage sweet but poison flattery? Oh, be sick, great greatness, and bid thy ceremony give thee cure. Canst thou? When thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it. No. When thou proud dream that plays so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king. To find thee. And I know it is not the balm, the scepter and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the facet title running for the king. The throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. No, not all these thrice gorgeous ceremony, not all these laid in bed majestical can sleep. 
so soundly as the wretched slave who, with body filled and vacant mind, gets him to rest, crammed with distressful bread, never sees horrid night, the child of hell, but like a lackey from the rise to set sweats in the eye of Phoebus, and all night sleeps in Elysium. Next day, after dawn, doth rise and help Hyperion to his horse, and follows so the ever-running year with profitable labour to his grave, and but for ceremony. Such a wretch, winding up days with toil and nights with sleep, had the forehand and vantage of a king. My lord, your nobles, jealous of your absence, seek through your camp to find you. Good for Llewellyn. Collect them together at my tent. I'll be before thee. I shall do it, my lord. O God of battles, steal my soldiers' hearts. Possess them not with fear. Take from them now the sense of reckoning ere the opposed numbers pluck their hearts from them. And not today, O oh Lord, O oh not today, think not upon the fault my father made encompassing the crown. I, Richard's body, have it turned anew, and on it bestowed more contrite tears than from it issued forced drops of blood. And Five hundred poor I have in yearly pay who twice a day their withered hands hold up towards the heaven to pardon blood. And I built two chantries with a sad and solemn priest sing still for Richard's soul, more will I do. But all that I can do is nothing worth, since that my penitence comes after all imploring pardon. My liege! A man clicks at his voice. Aye, I know thy errand. I will go with thee. The day, my friends, and all things stay for me. The sun does gild our armor. Up, my lords. Monsieur Cheval, my horse, valet, laquais, prêt. Oh, brave spirit. Via les yeux à terre. Rien puis l'air et feu. Ciel, cousin Orléans. Oh. Now, my lord constable. The English are embattled, you French peers. Mm. Hark, how our steeds for present service name. Mount them and make incision in their heights, that their hot blood may spin in English eyes and doubt them with superfluous courage. Yeah. <laughs> to horse, you gallant princes, straight to horse. Do but behold yon poor and starved band. And your fair show shall suck away their souls, leaving them with the shales and husks of men. There is not work enough for all our hands. Scarce blood enough in all their sickly veins to give each naked kirtle axe a stain that our French gallant shall today draw out and sheath for lack of sport. Let us but blow on them. The vapour of our valour will overturn them. What's to say? A very little, little let us do, and all is done. Then let the trumpet sound, for our approach shall so much dare the field that England shall catch down in fear and yield. Why do you stay so long, my lords of France? Come, come, away! Allez! The The sun is high, and we outwear the day. Where's the king? The king himself is rode to view their battle. 
of fighting Where men, they have full score. The king himself is rolled to view but their battle. Five to of one. Fighting men, they have Besides full they score. All are three thousand. God's arms. Best five to one. Tis a fearful Besides odds. Besides they all are fresh. Farewell, God's God. arms. Strength of us. Tis a fearful odds. Fight valiantly today. Farewell, good governor. <laughs> Oh, there be no hard. Fight fire, good Oh, there be no hard here, but one so. ten thousand of those men in England that do no work we today. Are to die. We are enough to walk up. Ross, we live to live. Fewer. We are enough to walk up. Ross, we live to live. Fewer. We are enough to walk up. We live to live. Fewer men. Right, Joe. I am not covetous for gold. Will. Don't care how you will feed upon my cost. Like Earns me not to spend my garments where such don't care how you things feed are not upon my God. desires. But if it be a sin to covet honor, I am the most offending soul alive. No faith, my cause. Wish not a man from England. God's peace I will not lose so great an honor as one man more methinks would share it from me. For the best hope I have, I do not wish one more. Rather, proclaim it, Exeter, through my host. He that hath no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made, and crowns for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that outlives this day and comes safe home will stand at tiptoe when the day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He that shall live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is Saint Crispian. Then will he strip his sleeve Show his scars and say these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, yet all shall be forgot, but he'll remember with advantages what feats he did that day. Then shall our names, familiar in his mouth as household words, Harry the King, Gower and Exeter, Pistol, Nim, Fluellen, and Williams be in their flowing cups freshly remembered. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day to the ending of the world. But we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few. We band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be he ne'er so vile, this day will gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England, now abed, will think themselves a curse they were not here. And hold their manhoods cheap, whilst any speaks who fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. Yes! My sovereign lord. Bestow yourself with speed. The French are bravely in their battle set and will with all expedience charge on us. All things are ready, if our minds be so. Perish the man whose mind is backward now. Our hearts are in the trip. You know your places. Our soldiers march away. Now thou pleases God. Dispose the day.
What is thy name? Discuss! Oh, Seigneur Dieu! Oh, Seigneur Dieu, should be a gentleman. Uh, perpend my words, oh, Seigneur Dieu, and mark. Oh, Seigneur Dieu, thou diest on point of fuck. <laughs> Unless, oh, Seigneur, thou to give to me egregious ransom. Oh, prenez miséricorde! Ayez pitié de moi! Moi will not serve! I will have forty moi! Or I will fetch thy rim out of thy throat in drops of crimson blood! Oh, it is impossible to save the force of the bras! Brass, car! Thou damned and luxurious mountain goat, offerest me brass! Oh, pardonnez-moi! Seest thou me so, I will have a ton of moi! Come here, the boy! Ask me this prisoner in French, what is his name? Come in, please, you play! Monsieur Le Fair! He says his name is Master Fair! Master Fair! Well, tell him I'll fair him and folk him and ferret him! Uh, oh. Discuss in French the same unto him! I do not know the French for fair and ferret and ferk! Bid him prepare for I will cut his throat! <laughs> Why this my sword? Oh, je me supplie. Hey, you Pour you you de Dieu! Me pardonnez! Gardez ma vie. Et je vous donnerai 200 écus. War is worse! He, he, he prays for you to save his life, and for his ransom, he'll give you 200 crowns. Oh, tell him my fury shall abate, and I the crowns will take. French have reinforced their scattered men. Then every soldier kill his prisoners. Give the word through. Every soldier kill his prisoners! Shame, nothing but shame. Let us die in honor once more back again. The soldier that hath spoiled us, friend us now. Let us on heaps go and offer up our lives. There are now yet of us living in the field to smother up the English in our throngs if any order might be thought of. The devil take order now. Out to the throng. Let life be too short, else shame will be too long. Alec!
employees and the luggage. It is expressly against the law of arms. It is as arrant a piece of knavery, mark you now, as can be offered. In your own conscience, is it not? To certain, there's not a boy left alive. And to the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle had done this slaughter. Besides, they have burnt and carried away all that was in the king's tent. <laughs> Wherefore, the king most worthily hath caused every soldier to cut his prisoner's throat. Ah, oh, tis a gallant king. <sighs> <laughs> Here comes his majesty. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. I will cut the throats of those we have, yeah. and not a man from them that we shall take shall taste our mercy. No. Here comes the leader of the French, my liege. His eyes are humbler than they used to be. How now? What means this? No, stand not that I find these bones of mine for ransom. No, King Henry, I come to thee for charitable license, that we may wander o'er this bloody field to book our dead and then to bury them, to sort our nobles from our common men. For many of our princes, woe the while, lay drowned and soaked in mercenary blood. I know not if the day be ours or no. The day is yours. Then praise be to God, and not our strength for it. What is this castle called that stands hard by? They call it Agincourt. Then call we this, the field of Agincourt, fought on the day of Crispin Crispianus. <laughs> Your grandfather of famous memory, and um, please, Your Majesty, and your great uncle, Edward the Black, Prince of Wales, as I have read in the Chronicles, fought a most brave battle here in France. They did, Flewellen. Your Majesty says very true. If Your Majesty is remembered of it, the Welshmen did good service in the garden where leeks did grow, and wherein leeks in their Monmouth caps which Your Majesty now to this hour is an honourable badge of the service. And I do believe Your Majesty takes no uh, scorn to wear the leak upon some dewy day. I wear it for memorable honour, for I am Welsh, you know. <laughs> oh, the water in why cannot wash out Your Majesty's wet blood out of your body. I can tell you that. <laughs> Thanks. Good my countrywoman. By Jesu. I am Your Majesty's countrywoman. I cannot do know it, I will confess it to the world. <laughs> I need not be ashamed oh. of Your Majesty, as long as Your Majesty is an honest man. God keep me so. Bring me just notice of the numbers dead on both our parts. Here is the number of the slaughtered French. This note doth tell me of 10,000 French that in the field lie slain. Of princes in this number, and nobles bearing banners, there lie dead 126. Added to these, of knights, esquires, and gallant gentlemen, 8,400. Of the which, 500 were but yesterday dub knights, so that in these 10,000 they have lost, there are but 1,600 mercenaries. The rest are princes, barons, lords, knights, squires, and gentlemen of blood and quality. Here was a royal fellowship of death. Where is the number of our English dead? with the Duke of York, the Earl of Suffolk, Sir Richard Ketley, Davy Gam, Esquire, 
none else of name. And of all other men, but five and twenty. Oh God, thy arm was here. And not to us, but to thy arm alone ascribe we all. When, without stratagem, but in plain shock, and even play of battle was ever known, so great and little loss on one part and on the other. Take it, God, for it is none but thine. Tis wonderful. Come, go we in procession to the village, and be it death proclaiming through our host a boast of this. We'll take the praise from God which is his only. Is it not lawful, uh, unpleased your majesty, to tell how many is killed? Yes, Captain, but with the acknowledgement that God fought for us. Yes, my conscience, he did us great good. Do we all holy rites? And then to Calais, and to England then. And there from France arrived more happy men. Doth fortune play the housewife with me now? News have I that my Nell is dead in the hospital <laughs> of malady of France. <laughs> and there my rendezvous is quite cut off. Old, I do wax, and from my weary limbs, honour is cudgelled. Well, bored I'll turn, and something lean to cut purse of quick hand. To England will I steal, and there I'll steal. <laughs> And patches will I get into these cudgelled scars. And swear I got them in the galley of wars. <laughs> Peace unto this meeting wherefore we are met. To our sister, France, health and fair time of day. Joy and good wishes to our most fair and princely cousin Catherine. And as a branch and member of this royalty by whom this great assembly is contrived, we salute you. 
Right joyous we are to behold your face, most worthy brother England. Fairly met. Mm. My royal queen, lead us so to the peace which you before so urged. I have but with a cursory eye or glanced the articles. It pleaseth your grace to appoint some of your council presently to sit with us once more. With better heed to resurvey them, we will suddenly pass our accept and preemptory answer. Sister, we shall. Go, Uncle Exeter, and take with you power to ratify, augment or alter as your wisdom best shall see, advantageable for our dignity. Anything in or out of our demands, and we'll consign thereto. Hmm. And now leave our cousin Catherine here with us. She is our capital demand, comprised within the full rank of our articles. She hath good leave. Fair Catherine, and most fair, will you vouchsafe to teach a soldier terms such as will enter at a lady's ear and plead his love suit to her gentle heart? Your Majesty shall mock at me. I cannot speak your England. Oh, interpreter. <clears throat> fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I'll be happy to hear you confess it brokenly with your English tongue. Do you like me, Kate? Pardonnez-moi, I cannot tell what is like me. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. Que uh, dit-il? Uh, que je suis semblable à losange? Oui, vraiment. Sa votre grâce sensitive là. I said so, dear Catherine, and I must not blush to affirm it. Oh, bon Dieu, la langue des hommes sont pleines de tromperies. What says she? That the tongues of men are full of deceits. Oui, that the tongues of the man is full of deceits. That is the princess. Well, the princess is the better English woman. In faith, Kate, my wooing is fit for thy understanding. I am glad thou canst speak no better English. For if thou couldst, thou wouldst find me such a plain king, I'd think I'd sold my farm to buy my crown. <laughs> I know no ways to mince it in love, but directly to say I love you. Then, if you were to urge me farther than to say, do you, in faith, I wear out my suit. Give me your answer, in faith do, and so... Uh, clap hands at a bargain, how say it, lady? The votre honor me understand well. Marry, if thou would have a husband, Kate, take me. I take me, take a soldier. Take a soldier, take a king. What sayest thou then to my love? Speak, my fair, and fairly, I pray thee. Is it uh, possible that I should love the enemy of France? No. It's not possible you should love the enemy of France, Kate. But in loving me, you should love the friend of France. For I love France so well, I will not part with a village of it. I'll have it all mine. And, Kate, when France is mine and I am yours, then yours is France and you are mine. I cannot tell what is that. No, Kate? Then I will tell thee in French. Oh. Which, I am sure, hang about my tongue like a new married wife about her husband's neck. Hardly to be shook off. Je. Quand, sur le possession de France, Quand vous avez la possession de moi? What then? Let me see. St. Dennis be my speed. Uh, donc, uh, votre est France, c'est vous mienne. <laughs> it is as easy, Kate, for me to conquer the kingdom as it is to speak so much more French. I will never move thee in French unless it be to laugh at me. C'est votre honneur, le François que vous parlez, il est meilleur que l'anglois, lequel je parle. Faith, Kate, no, it is not. But. Thy speaking of my tongue, and I thine, most truly falsely, must needs be granted to be much at one. But, Kate, dost thou understand thus much English? Canst thou uh, love 
Me? I cannot tell. Can any of your neighbours tell Kate? I'll ask them. Come. <laughs> I know thou lovest me. I do not know that. No. It is hereafter to know, but now to promise. Do but promise, Kate. How answer you? The plus spell de Catherine de Mond at Trade Divine Deacy. Uh, Your Majesty, a false French enough to deceive the most says demoiselle that is on France. Uh... Fie upon my false French, by my honour, in true English. I love thee, Kate. By which honour I dare not swear thou lovest me. Yet my blood begins to flatter me thou dost. Notwithstanding the poor, untempering effect of my visage. Now, beshrew my father's ambition. He was thinking of civil wars when he got me. I thought was I created with a stubborn outside, an aspect of iron that when I come to woo ladies, I fright them. But, in faith, Kate, the elder I wax, the better I shall appear. Therefore, most fair Catherine, will you have me? Come. Take me by the hand and say, Harry of England, I am thine. Which word? Thou shalt no sooner bless mine ear with all, but I shall tell thee aloud, England is thine, Ireland is thine, France is thine, and Harry Plantagenet is thine. Come, your answer in broken music, for thy voice is music, and thy English broken. Therefore, Queen of all, Catherine, break thy mind to me in broken English. Wilt thou have me? That is as it shall please la reine ma mère. Oh, nay, no, please her, Kate, it will please her well, Kate. <laughs> then it shall also content me. <laughs> oh. <sighs> well, upon that, I kiss your hand and call you my queen. Laissez, Monseigneur, laissez, laissez. Mes foi, je ne vous pois que vous avez ici votre rondeur en paix sur le main de votre seigneurie indigne, serviteur. Excusez-moi, je vous supplie, mon très puissant uh, no. seigneur. <laughs> Then I'll kiss your lips, Kate. Oh, les dames et demoiselles, pour être baissées devant leur nurse, il n'est pas à la coutume de France. My interpreter, what says she? It, it is not a fashion for the Lady of France to kiss before she is married, would she say? Oui, vraiment. Oh, Kate. Nice customs, courtesy to great kings. <laughs> Dear Kate, you and I cannot be confided in the weak list of a country's fashion. We are the makers of manners, Kate. And the liberty that follows our places stops the mouths of all fine faults. As I will do yours, for upholding the nice fashion of your country and denying me a kiss. Therefore, patiently. <laughs> and yielding. You have witchcraft in your lips, Kate. Oh. There is more eloquence in a sugar touch of them than in the tongues of the French council. And they should sooner persuade Harry of England than a general petition of monarchs. Mm. Here comes your mother. Oh. <clears throat> God save your majesty, my royal cousin. Teach you our princess English? I would have her learn, my fair cousin, how perfectly I love her. And that is good English. Will Kate be my wife? So please you. I am content. <laughs> we have consented to all terms of reason. The Queen hath granted every article, her daughter first, and then in sequel all, according to their firm proposed natures. Take her, fair son, and from her blood raise up issue to me, that the contending kingdoms of France and England whose very shores look pale with envy of each other's happiness, may cease their hatred. And this dear conjunction, plant neighborhood and Christian-like accord in their sweet bosoms, that never war advance his bleeding sword twixt England and fair France. 
Now welcome Kate, and bear me witness all that here I kiss her as my sovereign queen. God, the best maker of all marriages, combine our hearts in one, our realms in one. As man and wife, being two are one in love, so be there twixt our kingdoms such a spousal, that never may ill office or fell jealousy, which troubles up the bed of blessed marriage, thrust in between the passion of these kingdoms to make divorce of our incorporate league. That English may as French, French English men receive each other. Thus far with rough and all unable pen, our bending author hath pursued the story in little room confining mighty men mangling by starts the full course of their glory. Small time, but in that small, most greatly lived. This star of England. Fortune made his sword, by which the world's best garden he achieved. And Offed left his son, imperial lord. Henry the Sixth. An infant bands crowned king of France and England. Did this king succeed? Whose state so many had the managing. That they lost. France, and made his England bleed, which oft our stage hath shown, and for their sake. In your fair minds, let this acceptance take. Folks, we are all now together. We've got <laughs> Hal Chambers, Ooh. director. We've got Lauren Samuels and Aaron Sidwell. Um, everyone else at home, this is pre-recorded, but everyone else at home has just watched the Barn Theatre's 2019 production of Henry V. How? Ah, ah yes, indeed. Uh, how, how does it feel? knowing a, almost a year on that this material has been sort of let out into the world again. We'll start with you, Hal. Well, it's pretty exciting. I mean, uh, I hope it was any good because it's been a year. <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's truly exciting um, to share it with a wider audience. You know, it's, um, it was an explosive production with some cracking performances. And it spoke, it was a bit, I was saying to you earlier, it's a little bit like a time capsule. At the time, we were like in the in Broad and Brexit and and all of that, and the play was responding to that world. And you know, the world we're in right now is very, it's quite different actually. And um, <laughs> we're all stuck the at world home. Division, 
we're all stuck at home. But weirdly, like I'm feeling like a lot of these divisions are starting to get healed in a way um, because everyone's sort of had a bit of distance from all those shenanigans. But anyway, the play will be an interesting time capsule and and really responded to that to to literally that time, May 2019. And um, I can't wait to see watch it again. It'll be like watching it as a punter. So yeah. And Lauren, something. Lauren, how about yourself? Well, I'm just nervous that I got the French right, actually, in whatever. Because <laughs> I don't know. I was saying this to Aaron. Aaron called me earlier, and we were both like, but what production was it? <laughs> which show? Which showing? Um, yeah, no, I'm really I'm really excited because everyone that came to the show always, you know, loved it so much. and was like, oh, I've never seen anything like that before on stage. You know, everything that um, we managed to achieve, how I managed to achieve as a director. And so I'm actually just really excited to see it rather than be in it. And Aaron, for yourself, um, is it is it a scary thought bringing back Henry, or is it exciting to know that it's out there in the in the public now? I love that it's out there in the public. We we put so much work into this um, that the fact that actually now it can reach a much wider audience is is amazing. And uh, I was with Hal like a month ago and we were reminiscing about Henry and just saying, oh, it was such an amazing time. So the fact that we're now sitting here kind of still like with it is just cool. We all had such an amazing time doing the show. And are there any fond memories, particular memories for you folks that's really stick out something mad because it was a mad time or something hilarious for me i've known lauren for like ever but this was <laughs> the first time we'd actually worked together so I know, it, was. it was um in that sense that was that was really kind of special in a way because yeah you know, i got to work with a really good friend of mine um who was terrible to work with, I must say. <laughs> um, uh, you know, she was wonderful. And the fact that she's um, critiquing her own French is ridiculous because it was dead on. Um, to I'm the surprised point to hear that it changed on different French. nights. It, it, oh, well, was it no, meant no, to change? I was, or? I was very, I was really very good at helping at me point. out. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that was probably, and the, you know, Lauren and I had had digs together, and um, so that was that was a it was, that was really special, and um, just like just some of the bands were just so off the wall, like <laughs> they were so they were so good. And um, I think a lot of that came of from Square. oh yeah, Foursquare was Foursquare. iconic uh, to the people yeah, at home. Yeah, just a little. Yeah, little. I'll explain, shall I? What? Yeah, go for it. Is. Go for it's it. Essentially, <laughs> a game where you lay out four Please squares do. Um, with tape. You have a ball, a, a bouncy variety, and um, <laughs> four players can play at a time. They have to they have to hit it with their hands, sunny side up, no slam downs, and um, it can bounce once. Essentially, you know that's the essential game. And so there's a server who's in the fourth square, and you're all trying to move up the squares. Um, and you know I introduced it on day one. Some companies they enjoy it, you know, but they want to get on <laughs> with the work. But this company was, you know, actually up for doing more four square less Shakespeare. We don't want to do any work. Um, what, what was the ratio? What was the ratio of four square to um, Shakespeare? 50-50, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, Easily. I, I, I guess. <laughs> right, um, we even played four square at the start of the show. We used to, remember we had our pre-show um, while yeah. the audience were coming in and we used to, in mm. our costumes, ready to go, have a quick game of four square. It's what I was saying earlier. How? You, on you stage? Like, yeah. Yeah, How? I, did. I came up on stage. Little, uh, played a game. A little game. But um, the point of that so game friendly, is... You know? The point of that game is just obviously to, to warm up, but it, it does install a really fun rivalry within the company. And that, that was really <laughs> apt for this show. And I'll just tell you a quick, you know, talks about a, a memory. Uh, first off, I always remember it being quite, it was, it was really pretty nice weather when we opened the show. Yeah. It was a long tech week and, you know, the, the show opened, we're in sort of in previews. And I was living in the barn house, which is right um, by the theatre. And I was getting ready. I think I was having a shower or cleaning my teeth or something. And I heard out the window, sort of carried through the sunshine, uh, these sounds of like, ah, and I thought, what the hell? Is somebody getting murdered? <laughs> exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, you know, it was bloody Foursquare and Sarah, <laughs> and Scottish Sarah going, ah, no, or something like that. And um, I thought, blimey, you know, I've, I've given them this gift. Um, but they love warming up together. They love playing these games. 
and they took that energy onto stage. So for me, that game is actually about installing a love for each other and love of the game. So um, if there's anyone you know, struggling with what to do during social isolation, should they be gathering their family members to play Foursquare? If there's four, oh my god! If there's gosh, a family, then sorted. yes, but no help, no people outside of the household. <laughs> yeah, and keeping to two meter distance might be difficult for Sidwell because he always invades your box so oh he's terrible <laughs> he will invade your square Sidwell is naughty or square player Lauren used to <laughs> Lauren used to get so angry with me and storm out I like, did I used to have to storm out I used to have to leave me. the game it would always be me It'd just be like oh, I'm not playing anymore I can't stand him so um, yeah. you know <laughs> the barn theatre always bringing the nation the finest educational perspective on Shakespeare I'm thrilled do you know to what do you know what yeah do you know what my, my fond memory is when we first had the blood bags and we shot Alicia in the head in the car oh, park with the blood bag? <laughs> oh, wow. We should have decided to go there. We've like got it. the video. We've got the video. Okay. Ready? Lock on. Shout bang. Bang. <laughs> Alien. <laughs> Just, Just to contextualise this, we, um, we'd hope to use lots of um, real blood in the gun we, there's a lot of shooting there's all the noise it's a very noisy production i'm really sorry everyone but um there was a moment where uh, there are some people who meet and we wanted to have real blood splatters so it's something i've seen in other shows and um christos our brilliant um white director got very excited about this we did we did a little uh, <laughs> experiment out, out in the field next to the barn and let's just say we uh we wouldn't be <laughs> down that route. <laughs> um, it was bloody awful. Uh, it was well very messy, and um, yeah, we decided actually we we didn't need to do that because the gunshots were so loud and visceral that uh, didn't need it. But the experiment was um, yeah, it was an extraordinary moment. Now, the whole, On the, the gunshots, whole... go ahead. I man. always struggled with like I, I swear to God, every single show. It just changed as to whether I had two earplugs in, one earplug in, no earplugs, because I I had to do either a full scene beforehand or a full scene afterwards, having gunshots be around me on stage, and so I just feel like I'm either like underwater doing yeah. the scene yeah. and can't That's hear. That's the other thing, like people didn't realise how loud they were for us on stage as well. So if you were oh, getting shots at, in the head, it was so noisy. As Aaron said, you had to wear earplugs for the whole scene prior, just just for that bit, you know. Mm. You should be yeah. watching mouths. You should be watching yeah, mouths like... on stage. You'd be like, Sorry, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. As an and audio... of course, Lauren got, Lauren got shot in the head. You know, well, not really, but um, at that moment, she's playing boy. She's just done this speech. Oh, uh, the audience that. are really with her, and they're leaning in and going, oh, we love this little lad. God, I hope he never dies. And then the dope man shoots him in the head. <laughs> and, and for me, you know, it was about getting the audience in that small space, really in the midst of a war, you know, and it's and yeah. the gunshots sounds, not just the real gunshots, but the, the soundtrack was all around you. It was absolutely terrifying. Harry and Sam and Chris is just, you know, put us through hell. So, <laughs> Well, guys, uh, from my perspective, it was cool. anything but hell. It was really such a phenomenal experience uh, to see the work come to life and then see it being performed at the Barn Theatre. And I'm hoping that everyone at home has enjoyed the live stream. And I hope that we, this is the first of many things that we'll be doing here at the Barn Theatre as we have shut our doors for the time being, but I'm hoping that we possibly, even as a small theatre in the middle of nowhere, can change the game a little bit of how things happen uh, and the entertainment we can bring from a closed theatre. Um, you guys on uh, chatting to me now, Aaron, Hal and Lauren, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed revisiting this and I hope we get a chance to do it again soon. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Uh, Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.